now live. Uh-oh, don't have my earphone in. Hold on. This will help. I can hear myself. There we go. All right. Get everything set up. How to stock your pond for free is the topic I'm going to start with on this one. I was trying to bring... Um, my buddy Mickey on, he's got a pond, but I uh, can't figure it out yet, but that's okay. Next time, I'm going to have to figure out how to use StreamYard, I think. I don't have much experience with it. Hey, what's up, everyone? Thanks for joining. Frank, you like free? Yeah, man. If you understand how the balance works on a pond, you can essentially stock it for free. So it's like a seesaw. When one side of, it, of the situation or one, one side of the balance is up, predator side is up or the forward side is up, uh, they're opposite of one another, just like a seesaw. So, you know, for example, you drive all over the Southeast and you do electro fishing surveys in small lakes and in ponds for say 25 years. And you tell the guys, you know, your vast population is crowded, which they don't seem to understand. And your forage base is light. You know, you don't have enough forage. Your bass are too skinny. 100% of the time, every time, I'm going to call the fish hatchery right now and order some fish. And it's like, no, nah, man, that's not how this works. You know, you're not, you're not seeing this, you know, for, for what it is. It's a seesaw, right? If your bass population's up, your forage population's down and vice versa. So the solution to that problem is to harvest bass and that's free. It doesn't cost you anything. That frees up hunting pressure on the forage base whatever those fish species are, preferably bluegill, right? Because bluegill spawn multiple times during the summer. That's another thing we can kind of talk about. Um, the further away from a pure blue in a pond, especially in, or in small lakes, like small lakes, you know, you're going to have a very diverse forage base. Usually there's usually streams or rivers coming in there and you can't keep you know, the competing fish out. You can't keep the bullheads out. You can't keep the crappy out, shiners, all those kind of things generally pour into small lakes. Midwest, what's up, man? So guys make the incorrect assumption that since a lake has shiners, has bullheads, has all of crappy, has all these species of fish in it, that that's what you want in your pond. And it's actually the opposite because it's the space is limited. And there's a big difference between having 10,000 acres of water and having 10 acres of water. You can't put all the fish you want in there. So if you stocked a 10 acre pond, like we did, you know, like, like we recommend just with a nice bluegill base and some red ear, it's all you really need. You've got a situation there where the bluegill are, they're in such high numbers that as soon as bass eat them, they can replace themselves. It's called recruitment. And they just keep replacing themselves. If a bass eats a three inch bluegill, there's space for another one to, to come up in there and grow up into that space. And, and that's exactly what will happen because there's so much reproduction coming off every month when the water's warm. If you say replace half the bluegill population with another fish, it doesn't even really matter what fish. Well, it, it kind of does matter what fish, but for the sake of argument, let's just say it doesn't. Um, oops. <coughs> had some yogurt before I sat down. It's all over my shirt. I'm going to eat like a three-year-old. Um, uh, we'll just say crappy. Say you get crappy into your 10 acre pond. That's especially bad because that's another predatory fish. 
So the crappie are really good predators. They're really good at eating um, what bluegill want to eat. And they're also really good at eating the bluegill, what bass want to eat. So it's basically like having a throttle limiter on an engine. You it just they don't work well in, in small bodies of water. They're better in the river and in the in the larger lakes where there's just a lot more space for them. So what happens in that situation is the bluegill try to spawn every month or do spawn every month, even, even though you know half of them aren't being born in because the crappy replaced them. So the small bluegill that are born every month are eaten almost instantly by the crappy. And the part that guys forget about is it's the crappy fry are in there as well. When the crappy spawn in early spring, there's a bajillion tiny little crappy swimming around the edges and they're all predatory. So all the zooplankton that the bass and bluegill want to eat as soon as they're born, the crappy are eating. And then all of the crap or all of the bluegill that are, you know, little match head size kind of fish, they're getting wiped out by the small crappy. And then those crappy will grow up and then generally something, you know, a small bass or another crappy will eat them. So it's just not an efficient way to try to manage um, your fishery. And we'll generally recommend to drain the pond when you've got a bad crappy problem. Um, that was the guy I was going to bring on the night was Mickey. He's got a couple ponds with crappy one pond he's drained before, but I haven't figured out how to share the screen yet. I think I'm going to have to go get StreamYard. Um, there's a way to do it with the phone, but I can't figure out how to do it with the computer or the tablet. So I don't really want to use the phone. This is better this way. So I'll figure it out and I'll get Mick on and we'll talk about, you know, what happened, you know, to his pond in real time. But the idea there, like Golden Shiner, what's up, Corey? Um, I've seen guys want to stock golden shiner into their ponds and they don't understand that you're better with just leaving it with bluegill and feeding them because golden shiner don't spawn as much as bluegill. So by throwing golden shiner in there, they've got to take, they're, they're taking up food. They're ta they're eating insects. They're eating what bluegill want to eat. You haven't increased the amount of pounds of forage in that pond by stocking golden shiner. And that just goes like this on dudes. Well, I put more fish in there. Yeah, but you took away, you know, you, you, for every 10 pounds of Shiner, you take away 10 pounds of bluegill. It's literally a one-to-one -one type of deal. You can't just keep, if you want to increase the amount of forage in the pond, you have to feed that forage. You have to fertilize that pond or you have to add feed. And I like the feed. It's a little bit easier for like just people who don't really know what's going on because you can just watch the fish eat and you go out there and throw it in every day, or you can buy a feeder or whatever. I don't really care. Uh, the fertilization is tricky and usually people overdo it. Like they overstock and overdo anything. You know, there's a balance. We've talked about balance a million times in fisheries and you can't put as much fertilizer as you want. You can't even put as much feed as you want. Like if you overfeed your pond, you'll kill it. So I don't, I don't um, check for, um, oh yeah, I can't touch this screen. Oh yeah. I don't like this heart thing. I don't know what the heart, I don't know why I would want to put a like on my own chat. Anyway. So yeah, that's what I mean by stocking your pond for free. You have to, if if you remove bass, you're letting up on that pressure. You know, there's not as many bluegill being consumed. And when you consider like even a one pound bass, it has to eat 10 pounds of bluegill to gain one pound. And when you remove it from the pond, think about how many bluegill are surviving that aren't being eaten. And you need to be removing on any pond, really, probably about 10 one-pound bass per acre per year. Now you're probably managing it in the ballpark of, of normal, of average. So, again, let's take our 10-acre pond as an example. That's 100 one-pound bass a year you need to be keeping. 
some years, 150 is probably going to be necessary. Now, how many people do you know keep that many bass? How many people do you want to even catch 100 bass? You know, they don't. And I can't tell you how many times I've gone to guys, 10, 15, 20 acre ponds, and said, look, man, like you've got basically two sizes of fish. You've got a whole pond full of one pound bass, and you've got maybe five or 10 bass that can eat those one pound bass. That's it. They see that one big fish. You hold up one big fish, and that means the pond is healthy and balanced and perfect to them. And that's not how it works. And that's why I want to bring Mick on, too, because he can tell you when you when you balance out a 10-acre pond, you will catch eight-pound bass all the time, like every time you go. It's stupid. But guys have never seen, like, what a properly managed pond looks like. And... That's what we're going to be doing. Hopefully, get we can get um, Mickey's pond drained and started over again. There's always problems with doing that kind of thing. Um, I think right now he's working on trying to find like replace the drain system, and you know, there's a lot of maintenance that you can do while the water's down. And he's working on that stuff. It's always a hassle. It never goes smoothly. Um, if you've got more than if if you're not the sole owner of the lake or pond, which Usually it doesn't, you know, it's not that way. You'll never get everyone on the same page to agree. You know, there'll always be someone there that's like, nope, that's not happening that way. Um, so that's why I was really lucky to get a hold of Sugar Hill and be able to be like, look, all right, this is how this works. And this is how we do it. This is the reasons we do it. These are scientific reasons why we do it. You know, none of this is, none of this is opinion. It's all been proven scientifically. Um, almost a hundred years ago now. Wow. Nine folks. That's awesome. If you guys have any questions, throw them up there. Caught a uh, Clint sent in a picture of a three and a half pounder the other day. I'm sure you guys saw that on Instagram. Uh, that's good, you know, but at the same time, you know, let's talk about what I've seen in the past because these fish are not F1s and F1s are, are, but just grow better. Um, I've had bass go to two and a half pounds in 11 months, you know, not even a full year after stocking them. You put them in say June and it's like March, April, the next year, and they're already two and a half pounds. And then you see that again and there'll be about five pounds about this time. And they will be a little more uniform too. Like because our genetics are mixed up in this pond, we've got some that are, two pound fish and some that are four pound fish. I got something in my eye. <clears throat> Which is interesting. I haven't usually when you stock a pond new, the bass will all be the same size. Uh, those F ones will generally grow at about the same rates. I mean, there'll be maybe like a half a pound of difference between them. Um, maybe three quarters, but they're usually all about the same. There's usually not two pounds of difference like we're seeing in these fish, which is interesting. I, but again, I've never done this before. This never done it with this type of genetic setup this way. So it's a learning experience. And now what we'll see too is like if you wherever you guys are at, you got Midwest up there, got Frank in Canada. I don't, Corey, I don't know where you're from, man, but wherever you're from. You could take a two and a half acre pond in Canada. You could take a two and a half acre pond in the Midwest. You could take a two and a half acre pond in Georgia. And <clears throat> we're going to recommend you do it all the same way, but there will always be slight variations, you know, weather, soil content, you know, fertility goes into a soil stuff, whatever's going on with your soil. Um, you won't get the same rates. You know, they'll be close, but they, they won't all be the same. And then sometimes there was one guy who was following me. Um, he's got some northerns in South Carolina. He stocked from Titan Bass, and they're all about four pounds. But that was a funny conversation. I kind of called it. I was like, wow, that's great. You know, he stocked all pure northern. He didn't even do the Floridas like us. He just put pure northern in there. And um, they're all, you know, three eight, three nine, four, four one, right in there. <clears throat> three and a half. I think he had one, three and a half I saw, but 
again, more similar to what you'd expect out of a new pond, but his growth rates are so exceptional, especially just for Northerns that I knew he had to be overfeeding just in the, in the way that's a few things that he said, the way he was talking. And I was like, um, have you had, if he's noticed any fish stress, have you had any fish kills? And of course he did. So he pushed it really hard and he got really good bass growth by pushing it really hard by, by feeding. But then he also had a fish kill and that's a slippery slope. Um, he probably lost some bass that he didn't realize that he lost. And he's really, really lucky that he didn't kill the whole thing. Because once your plankton bloom gets too high, you can't, it's really hard to get that phosphorus back out. You have to be really careful when either feeding, especially fertilizing the pond. Feeding, there's like I said, it's a little bit easier for on, on everyone. You can kind of see what you're doing. And, and generally, feed is so expensive now that it's pretty hard to overfeed. Uh, usually when you'll see overfeeding is you'll see them pushing with like, you need about, I don't know, one feeder for every probably five to seven acres, maybe 10. I mean, you can get away with one feeder on 10 acres, but once you get to about 10 acres, you need to be thinking about maybe two feeders. But sometimes you'll see people wild out and they'll have like four feeders on a five acre pond. No, nah, man, that thing's going to look like pea soup and you're going to have dead fish. And that's bad because oxygen stress is limiting. You know, if, you, if you're if you pushing that hard, you're probably trying to grow something big. And it's really hard to grow nice fish when they're stressed that badly for oxygen, when they're stressed that badly for anything. You don't want them stressed at all, really. But... <clears throat> I'm just having issues today. I'm about to choke. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry about that. I guess it's allergies or something. No questions in the chat? I don't think I see any questions. I might not be looking at the chat right, though. Let me scroll with the mouse pad. I don't think I'm doing that wrong. There's some kind of learn more button. I'm not going to push that. That's probably going to take me someplace I don't want to be. Anyway, that's our pond management 101 and how to stock your stock your pond for free. Um, and now one thing looking forward that we'll probably be doing at Sugar Hill. It probably won't be this year, though. I thought about maybe doing it this year, but Clint is adamant about wanting um, – huge bass. I mean, he's going to push for the biggest bass possible. So one thing we're probably going to add is gizzard shad. And if you go look in the book, they'll tell you that's a big mistake. And I have definitely seen it where it was a big mistake. You have to be aware of a lot of factors before you start putting gizzard shad in there. And the first factor is what is the size of the bass population? Like I said, um, we st I'll just use Sugar Hill as an example. Right now, our bass are between two and four pounds. Getting borderline. Like if every single bass in that pond was an F1 and every single bass in that pond was five pounds right now, we'd be closer. We'd be, that would be a situation where we could add gizzard shad. But just like I said earlier, when you add the gizzard shad, you're taken away from the bluegill. So... And they, they go wild. I mean, shad are crazy. But what you'll find, too, is in the smaller ponds, the gizzard shad do a little bit better. Um, you'll have bigger school, you'll have big schools of small fish. Um, that's a good question, Dustin. I'll get to it in one sec. Um, you'll have big schools of small shad in small ponds. And I have seen ponds in the two to 10 acre range that have gizzard shad that have more five pound plus fish than you can imagine. It's like stupid. But the problem you get when you do that is you limit, <clears throat> you limit the recruitment of the bluegill. <clears throat> Sorry about that boys. I'm just dying over here. Um, you limit the recruitment of the bluegill. So what you're doing then is limiting 
the amount of small bass that you're going to have coming up into the system. And you have to watch that. You really have to watch that closely. And the feeder offsets that, right? So I've got a lot of things going for me that, and a lot of experience using them too, to know that I can get away with using them, using them in this pond. Uh, one is how the pond is set up. Like it's, it's a small, it's a small pond anyway, but it's not a deep pond. There's not really any place for those shad to get out in the middle and get away. It's like a long, narrow pond. And the bass can easily ambush the schools of shad from both sides. And I've also got a pond owner that if the shad just for, and I don't really expect it to happen, but if they did go crazy and, and, uh, take over this take over the pond on me um client would just train it and start it all over again he wouldn't have a problem with it so there's that that's very important thing to have in your back pocket because any of this can you, know, you can mess any of this stuff up but that being said um it'll probably be next winter i usually add the shad uh january february they spawn pretty early in the spring and um you want to have some big shad in place, but the, the most important thing is to have a bass population in place to eat those shad. If I would have put those shad, excuse me, if I would have put those shad in at the beginning, they, the pond would be just full of shad right now. And that's bad because there's no bass and they're big enough to eat big shad. So I would just have a bunch of big, big shad that are limiting all the other fish. Um, if you have, say we have a thousand acres of carrying capacity, or I'm sorry, a thousand pounds of carrying capacity for a two and a half acre pond that's fed and it's full of 800 pounds of gizzard shad, then you only have 200 pounds of game fish, bass and bluegill combined. That's how that works. And that's how, that's how gizzard shad get you in trouble. They can just take it over. All right. Dustin's got a question coming in. Is there any benefit to stocking crawfish? He's teaching Jimmy Houston dumping great big bags in his ponds. And what's the idea behind it? Well, Dustin, honestly, it kind of goes back to where we started at the beginning of this. Guys think they can take money and grow bass. And the guys who sell the crayfish aren't going to tell them any different because that's how they make money too. And I don't sell crayfish and I don't sell bait fish. So I'm telling you straight, he's not. Let me put it to you this way. I've had ponds like Sugar Hill Outdoors. Have you seen me stock any bass? I'm, I'm sorry, any crayfish? No. Have you seen me stock any of Supplemental Forge? No. All right. The only thing we did was get the bluegill population established and feed it because I understand that there's a limit, right? So let's say you take a 50 pound bag of crayfish and you dump it in. Well, you've just put enough forage in that pond to grow five fish, one pound. But if you have a 10 acre pond or the bigger it gets, the worse this, this factor gets, you know, um, if it's like a half an acre pond and you've got a very limited number of bass, you say you've got like 20 bass, 25 bass. Yeah. You might be able to make some kind of statistical advantage on that. You got 15 acres of water, 20 acres of water where you've got, you know, 500 to a thousand bass that you're managing 10 acres will hold about 500 maybe and then you know double it for 20 think about each one of those crawfish and when when you spread them across that many fish you haven't increased the weight of the bass at all they're expending energy to catch them for one and yeah it is supplemental forage is it hurting the bass population absolutely not i mean you're not you haven't you haven't completely wasted your money. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is I've seen guys do that. I've seen guys with plenty of money, bring the stock truck in, spend thousands and thousands of dollars stock in their pond. But you know what I haven't seen? I haven't seen their bass grow any faster than bass at Sugar Hill Outdoors. As a matter of fact, they usually don't grow that fast because they don't listen to me and they stock too many daggum fish to begin with. Well, I'm, I'm just going to, I know you told 100, but I put 150. Yeah, I told you 100 for a reason, Holmes, because you can't support 150. And that is fishery consulting to the T right there. You know what to do. You know how to do it, right? You've done it in a couple situations like Sugar Hill and a few other places. But can you get anybody to listen to you? Like, 
99, like probably 95% of the guys that I consulted with did not listen to me like Clint did. Did not. And they did not get bash growth like Clint did. Did not. Because they go online and they kind of selectively pick out, they cherry pick what they want to hear, what their level of understanding of this stuff is. And then they do what they want and they write their own checks. And then, of course, when you're doing this for money, it's like, all right, so the guy, so I'm, I've done it before. You know, the guy's like, oh, I want to put crawfish in the pond. Now, the one thing I don't have a problem with that, when you dump all those red crawfish in there, it makes the red crankbaits and all those bites will get a little bit better. Um, you'll, they'll get keyed in on red for a good while, six, six eight months. Um, one thing I learned, though, through the tackle, doing the Tackle Talk podcast, too, since you brought up crayfish, um, there was a doctor of, you know, crawdad doctor on that thing, on the bait breakdown that we did. And he was really interesting because he was talking about all the species of crawfish that they're still identifying. Like the, the research, there's not like a whole bunch of crawfish research. You know, there's not a whole bunch of money in crawfish research. There's not a whole bunch of crawfish research, right? So that's kind of behind and they're finding new species of crawfish everywhere. So if you take a bunch of crawfish in Louisiana and dump them into your pond, you're displacing native crawfish, right? Some of that they haven't even probably haven't even identified yet, depending on where you are. So you don't know those crawfish that you're displacing are native to the area. They're better suited for that environment than crawfish in Louisiana. Does that make sense? You don't know what you're doing to the natural cycle of the forage base by doing that. And I've never seen, sorry, I'm just dying from allergies. Um, I've never seen that. I don't know if we'll ever see that level of research into our fisheries and pond management because again, it this the research takes money and I don't know who's going to, who's going to pay for that kind of research project to see, you know, the differences between native crawfish populations and stocked crawfish populations but to me, that stocking of crawfish, that additional stocking of forage fish, the shiners, the I'll, gi I'll give you a pass on threadfin shad because they do. I've seen threadfin shad work wonders in some ponds. Um, I've also seen them. You put them, you spend fifteen hundred dollars for ten thousand of them, and you put them in and they're gone. You know, and you just threw fifteen hundred dollars away where you could have taken that $1,500 and bought $1,500 with a high protein fish feed and fed your bluegill. And you see what you can get with that. That's like a guaranteed result, you know, with your, um, with your $1,500. And again, $1,500 for thread fins, that's on about a five acres. You, if you got 10 acres, you need two loads. You got 20 acres, you need four. All right. So now you're at $6,000 in shad. And I've seen guys eat that. I've seen guys eat five stacks in shad that just don't work. And then you know what they do? Go get 5,000 more and throw it in. And it's like, man, you know, if you took that 10 grand and put it in feed. I'm getting some more questions in. What's up, Mike? Thanks for joining. I'm over here having um, an itching fit all over my face from something in the air. I think maybe somebody's burning something around here. Sometimes I get like this around campfires i don't notice there are some people at their cabin over there maybe that's what's going on all right so southeast kayaks coming through oh uh, i'm missing one here oh he put a feeder on yeah you're gonna you're gonna see um yeah i saw your artificial structure in southeast that looked pretty good um bulk it up, you know, make it as limmy as possible. And, uh, I've had, I've had mixed results with, with plastic structure like that. I think it depends on what is available as far as structure goes, um, naturally in your pond. And what I'm getting at is if you have structure, if you have decent wood structure, decent rock structure in the pond already, you might not see fish con concentrate on plastic structure like that. But if you don't have any kind of structure in there, 
oh man, it, I've seen it work wonders too, you know? So it depends on, you know, kind of what you're fighting against and, and where the fish want to be located. Uh, try to sweeten up the spots where you know you've caught fish before too. There's something about that. You know, it's just uh, kind of let the bass tell you what they want, I guess is what I'm getting at. I've run the shock boat. You see it. Uh, it's like, the areas of the pond that, that turn big fish up, the electric fishing boat, turn them up consistently. And I mean, for over a 15 year period, you go into this corner and you're like, man, we're fixing to get a big fish. And you normally do. Um, there's something about the way bass will set up in holes like that because it's easier for them to feed. It's a convenience store for them. It's, 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 a, it's an easy spot to get a quick meal. And the biggest bass will just take over those spots because it's the easiest spot to get a big meal and nothing can mess with them. Put the feeder on the brim. That's perfect, man. Um, I don't understand what you're talking about there. That's all right. We'll skip it on. Oh, thanks, Dustin, man. I appreciate you. All right, so Southeast Kayak's coming back in. He also took out a, a 200 pounds of bass and the 8 to 14 inch. Yep. And you've seen a one to two pound increase in the weight of the healthier bass. Okay. So that is a good example too, man. It's like sometimes that happens that quickly and it's, it's not as common, but you do see it. Sometimes you take out 200 and then you take out 400 and then you take out 600 and you don't over a three year period is what I'm getting at. Um, 200 one year, then 200 the next year, then 200 the third year, and you still don't see any results. You still have skinny, stunted fish. You and it, it, I don't really know why it works that way. Um, I think maybe age, maybe bulk of those bass in that fishery, maybe you caught it before they got really old and stunted. But I'm guessing, you know, I don't have any hard science on that. But I have seen that before where you go out there and you're like, okay, your bass population is crowded. You got a bunch of one to two pound fish. Let's, you know, let's go get 20 pounds of them out per acre. And the next year, everything just inflates and it just fixes it. You know, it's just like magic. It's like, wow, that worked great. You know, I've seen that. And again, I'd say out of every every 10 stunted ponds that somebody's actually paid attention and, and tried that, I'd say probably four of them were happened like you, where you instantly see just really good results right off the jump. And then the six of them, you know, it's kind of mixed or if you see anything at all. And it takes a few more, it takes three years on some of them before you see that one to pound, two pound jump. But that's a perfect example, man, of proper management, you know, and it's really no different than if, if somebody said, Hey, let's get rid of the hunting season for deer. You know, you, you got to shoot a few deer, you know, um, it's just how the world works. You have to thin them down. And that's where we lost. We're catching release has really just been a disservice for, you know, I know you've heard me say it before. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, and that's catch and release. Everybody has good intentions um, with that, but it's not how it works. And it's been going on for so long now that our fish are just starved. Kayak saying he's got old sand pits. Oh, he's got oh, you got sand pits uh, from five that are five years old. Okay, yeah, and that's probably too why you're seeing it. Uh, if they're only five, you know they haven't been stunted that long, like I was talking about. Um, you still got some pretty young fish in there that can adjust to that and, and, and get back and start growing again. <clears throat> and you'll see it. Keep an eye then too on your on that. Basically, you don't really have to go under ten inches, and you'll notice this too, man. Like. It'll be probably one more year. You need a good population of bass over 16, 17 inches, right in that range. And when you start getting that, those eight and eight inch fish just won't be there anymore. Those bass will eat them. 
and you're not going to have to harvest those. So you'll be you'll bump your slot limit up to about the 12 to 14 inch size. And excuse me, I tell guys all the time, one pound bass, like 1.0 to 1.9, that's usually your enemy. Over that is usually your friend. And you'd be putting back, you know, two, two and a half pounds. Those start going back. Anything under that, though, start it needs to go in a cooler. You know, it needs to be fish tacos. And if you can get that mindset, you have good fishing for a long time, especially with a feeder like that, man. You, you won't be disappointed in that pond at all. Anyway, I am absolutely about to itch my face off. Hey, 15 folks, thanks for joining, man. If any of you guys have any questions, just drop them in the thing. We've been talking about, well, we've been talking about pond management all over the place now. Started out talking about how to stock your pond for free, but that falls right into what I just said. Harvest. Reduce the hunting pressure on the forage base, and it will recover. You'll notice, too, we talked about, oh, Southeast got another question coming through. Uh, have I seen bass eat the protein pellets? Yes. And if you watch on Sugar Hill Outdoors, those bass are pellet trained. And I don't really care for pellet trained bass. Um, I don't really care for tofu either. <clears throat> I don't see the point in feeding a predator 50% protein. I think it's kind of a gimmick, honestly. And I, I bought those bass because that those were the ones that I needed genetically and those are the ones that were available and they just happened to be pellet trained and that's fine. You know, they can eat, they can go in there and roll on some pellets a little bit. That ain't going to kill them. But again, I'll just make this point. I've seen pellet trained fish and I've seen unpellet trained fish. There's pellet trained fish right over there in Sugar Hill Outdoors. Are they any bigger than the unpellet trained fish that I've ever managed? Hell no. You know, so what's the point? Save the money. One thing I don't like about pellet train, if you've noticed, we got um, scoliosis in some of our fish. We have a higher rate of scoliosis in Sugar Hill Outdoors right now than would be naturally occurring. And I've probably seen, I don't know, maybe four or five fish with scoliosis. They say that it's in the northern, it's not the Floridas. But that falls into that stupid pellet training because they take those fish at really small sizes and they put them in tanks and they throw that feed in. The pellets have to be fallen for the bass to eat them. If they, the bass won't go pick them up off the bottom. They have to be moving through the water column usually. So they get those little bass and they throw the pellets to them every day and they pellet train them. That's what pellet trained means, but they've got to do it at that small size when they're fried you can't pellet train a fish that's already been on fish that ain't gonna work and they, they don't care anymore um and that's where that scoliosis comes from you get because again they're not eating anything natural and it's the development stage of the fish so it's, it's normal to see scoliosis like we're seeing it's a little bit higher in this pond than i've seen before um there's nothing i can do about it and i just got humpty looking weird kind of back a few few of my fish got weird humpty backs uh they're growing great i mean there's nothing there's nothing um wrong you know there's just like a kid with scoliosis you know he's gonna be fine he's got a crooked back um and it won't be transferred over to their it's not a genetic thing per se you know it's not going to be a higher rate of scoliosis forever it's just this first generation of fish that repellent train we won't have that with and that's uh, just part of it you know um i'm certainly not going to drain the whole pond because i've got you know 10 fish with scoliosis <clears throat> i'm gonna have to get my glasses on it's stupid i cannot read this thing all right, Southeastern Kayak says, would I allow fishing during the spawn? Yeah, I don't care, man. That's another myth these guys have made up, that they've somehow affected the spawn by fishing it. I haven't. Um, quite frankly, that we've got, you know, people been bed fishing for the last 30 years, and every one of our lakes has stunted out with bass to hell and back. You know, they haven't infected the bass reproduction whatsoever. Um, that's the part that even too, it's like bass, 
the shallow is a relative term. Everybody thinks all the bass are spawning up there in that last in the 12 inches of water over there at the edge, and they're not. Um, as a matter of fact, those bigger, smarter fish are in a little bit deeper water because they understand that there's bird predators that can get them during the spawn. So, um, bass are bedding in deeper water than people realize is what I'm, is what I'm getting at. And in Sugar Hill Outdoors, they'll bed right in the bottom down by the drain. It's only about 10 feet deep right there. That's technically shallow, you know. Um, even out here in Rodman, you know, we've got 20 something feet, 24 feet out here behind me. And down by the dam, there's 20 feet of water. That's getting pretty deep. You're probably not going to see bass beds down there. But I have certainly seen bluegill beds in 28 feet of water. I saw them in Rome, as a matter of fact, on the on the graph. You can see bluegill beds on the side imaging in like 28 feet of water. And it's because substrate was better down there. And, well, it's because the fish wanted to spawn down there, you know. Um, it doesn't – it's way more complex than these guys will lead you to believe online most of the time is what I'm getting at. So – yeah, fish them. I don't care. Uh, you're not going to. Females, that's another thing guys don't realize. It's not a one and done thing. Females don't go lay their eggs in a bed, spawn one time, and they're done, especially the big ones. And if you think about it, it's smart genetically. F big female bass lay their eggs in several different nests over, you know, over a couple week period. They can hold their eggs back, and they, they very rarely drop them all in one nest. And like I said, when you think about that, that's smart. Um, it gives you, gives you fry a better chance of surviving if you spread them over a couple different, you know, nests like that over a couple week period. Uh, bass are not sensitive fish that, uh, you know, they're tough, too tough for their own dang good. Like if they would get under 70% relative weight and just die, just be like, okay, this is not enough energy and I'm just going to die at, you know, 68% relative weight and under. I'm just going to die because they probably should. They're, they're starved half to death when they're that size. Um, that would be better than what we have right now because then guys would know, oh, my God, there's a problem. When the, when the fish float up, believe me, the sky is falling. And that's Bass's problem. They're so tough, they can swim around like zombies, just skinny and starve to death and just not die. And – it, if they would not, if I could, they could not hear it swam off. It's okay. No, that's not how this works. It's, you know, bass are extremely, extremely tough. And just because it swims away doesn't mean it's okay. Anyway. Southeast says he's seen bass spawn in 11 feet. Yeah, man. I don't doubt that. I've seen, I've seen bass beds in 15 feet and, it's a little bit bigger pond, you know, 20, 20 acres, 24 acres. I saw them that deep one time. Um, oh, there's Steven. What's up, Steven? He says you want to hammer and harvest fish during the spawn. Yeah, 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 sometimes, man. That's fine with me. Get them out of there. Dustin saying he caught one. Look like it went through a blender and healed. <laughs> no doubt, man. They're too damn tough. Sometimes they're too tough for their own good. Hey, 17 folks, thanks for joining them, fellas. I appreciate y'all, or ladies, if there's any ladies in there. I think this page is about 95% men, so I say fellas. But <laughs> Mike says, Big Brother's watching us. There's a scoliosis, scoliosis commercial on. Yeah, I'm not surprised, man. AI is watching us all at this point. It's like being in Vegas trying to gamble. I don't know. I wish I wasn't itching like this, though. I'm going to have to go get some medicine here. 44 minutes. We've been on for a while. I've been running my yap. Y'all see Georgia play yesterday? You got that right, little Rich. It's 1984 for real. You know, Bulldogs took it to them yesterday. I'm proud of those boys, man. They they didn't look good on the first play for sure, but they've been doing that all the whole season, man. They let that first that first drive is is bad, and they seem to get it together. Chris has got a um, question coming through. 
Uh, what do I recommend with Comrades Visit My Ponds? Yeah, it's on site with them, if you know what I'm saying. You don't want them. Just, uh, I could get dinged for the things that I say. I have to be careful. I don't want to get dinged. But, um, yeah, and they're also endangered. They're, although they're not endangered, they're, I think they're still on the endangered list. So you don't talk about that. Um, but I have had, let's see, one, two, three, probably about half a dozen ponds where, you know, just like Sugar Hill, you, you, you got everything set up. It's rolling great. The fish look great. You know, it's, it's a thing of beauty. But that particular pond is close to a major reservoir where you get comorants and um and yeah it, they wipe you out and they especially love eating bluegill that have been on a feeder because they're um, obviously not as fast as natural bluegill and they're stacked and they're like freaking cordwood so they're easy to catch not that those stupid comorants need i mean it's no chance comorants are way faster than them <laughs> that's right dustin <clears throat> um yeah so you can have the same kind of issues with otters um steven's in the in, in there i saw him we had an issue with otters at georgia on the aquaculture pond um one year we were there we had a third of an acre of water that we grew out to we were catfish in and um Man, I went out there all summer. Somebody had somebody had to feed the fish, and I was around that summer. So we went out there and fed them, and um, kept up with those stupid fish all summer. And then, sure enough, man, up from the Oconee River, the stupid otters got in there. And those jokers were like cats too, man. They kill fish just to kill them. They wouldn't like go in there and get a fish and eat it and take it and then go away. They'd go get a fish, eat it, till they're gorged on it, puke like they've got an eating disorder and then go back and catch another one, eat half of it, puke, go back and get another one, eat half of it. It was like, it didn't make any sense at all. Boom cannon. Yeah, that works. 12 gauge works. <laughs> but yeah, don't, um, don't advertise that. Cause like I said, you can be getting in trouble with the, with the, with the law. Um, you definitely want to try to deter them as much as they can. You know, you're seeing a comrade sit on a, uh, put his wings out like that. And um, no, Mike, I, I don't know of any kind of thing you can use to deter them. I was just about to say, when they put their wings out like that, it's a signal to all the other stupid comrades around that can see for a bajillion miles that, hey, I'm over here and I'm eating and I'm eating so good that I saturated my wings and I've got to put this black cross up like that right and say hey it's an advertisement for all the other fish that or, i mean all the other birds that can see that they've they've eaten to the point where they've saturated their wings in there and uh, that's a problem oh yeah steven says he filmed an otter in the river yeah they they do much uh Weasel in a hen house, Dustin. That's exactly right. Beavers can cause you issues in your drains, man. I've had that happen before. Crap. Oh, my God. We had a, I remember one is a buddy's house in South Georgia where I was deer hunting. If y'all are watching that, um, his dad had a little three acre pond in a cornfield, a standpipe drain, you know, that goes under, it goes, it looks like that. It goes under the dam and up and the water just falls in the pipe. We call that standpipe. And he built this nice three acre pond. It's all no stream coming in, all um, watershed fills. And you worry about trash fish getting in there. You know, we had it set up just right. And then um, it did, it was in a big, it was in an agriculture field though. So um, when there's not any uh, trees, it, it depends on what's in the watershed as to how much water comes into the into that pond and it was a it was a pond for running a center pivot but he didn't want to take up a bunch of space in the field because you know he makes money growing stuff in there so he made it smaller than 
he could have. He could have made a bigger pond, but it would have taken up more of his field. So he made it a smaller pond to get the amount of water that he needed stored. And then, um, so when, when you do that, when you have a larger watershed than your pond, because you depend how big your watershed is, depends on how big the pond can be. So he had a real big watershed and a real little pond. So that caused a lot of flow through. Well, that flow through, those beavers didn't like it. And they piled up mud and corn husks all the way up around that standpipe drain where it was 12, 13 feet deep right there. They piled mud up like a pyramid up so they could climb and get in the top of the damn standpipe and then took mud and corn husk and packed that standpipe, slapped full of mud and corn husk, and it never ran again. We got it to break loose a few times, but you just – you can't – busy as a beaver you know they stay stays pretty steady on it and um it's just crazy man <laughs> yeah steven's putting targets up I must have hit something must have been on target with something yeah uh, so when you when that happens to you though you know you spend money and when you when you get into building ponds you'll see man it's not cheap and you spend money building that dam up and then they clog the drain up and then the water runs over the dam or starts running around the emergency spillway all the time. And emergency spillways aren't designed to run 24 seven. They're, they're designed to run when there's an emergency. So then it starts cutting over there and cutting into the dam and causing all kinds of problems and cutting into your money is what it's doing. <clears throat> yeah, man, got to shoot those stupid things sometimes. What's up, Big Balloon? Good to see you, man. Hey, 18 folks. That's good. Run the numbers up. I am about, let's see, last I looked, I was at 1,400 hours. So on YouTube, you got to get um, 4,000 watch hours. You got Well, you got to have 1,000 people watching. You have 1,000 subs. And then you got to have 4,000 watch hours in a year in 365 days and then you start getting paid like you used to have commercials you know like the commercials when they go across your videos and stuff you start getting paid for that so that's the goal is to get to 4,000 and right now I'm about 1,400 and some change so not quite halfway but I mean I've only been really hard at YouTube now for about three months. Not that I haven't had YouTube, but I haven't been consistently feeding into it. You know, you got to feed this algorithm. Um, if you guys are trying to climb up on social media in, in any way, I would recommend daily posts. Um, it's a lot of work. It's especially hard work on YouTube because of what you're up against. Um, you pretty much got to have a degree in film too. You need to know how to edit. And that's my problem is I don't know how to edit that good. So it's time consuming for me to edit just to, then I know I'm doing a terrible job, but I'll learn. I'll figure it out. I try to put as much good information in the voiceover and hope people just tolerate my bad editing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Lake was stingy today, Rich. Yeah, I hear that. I talked to a guy. They've got a little um, ABA kind of bass fishing thing around here. Um, I think I'm going to fish with those boys. It's like a non-boater and uh, fish the river. I, I mainly want to fish with them on the St. John's over there because it's so damn big. Um I know there's good fish over there, but I'm, I've been over there a few times, but I'm not doing very well in there. And Rodman is just plain tough. Um, but every single fishing guide and every single person I've talked to around here said the same thing about Rodman. So I don't feel so bad about it. Yeah, Big Malone, that's what I'm saying. But you know what, though, man? It's going pretty good because I've gotten – um. three i'm trying to i can't even think back to what it was um it's hard to do though i mean it is it is hard but again i've been doing i've been doing at least one short a day and try to get one long format in there every other day and by long format i just mean not one minute um 
if it's a one minute one, you're better off putting it in shorts because everybody's trying to, in, in, in here it's called shorts on Instagram. It's called reels. And both of those things are competing with TikTok. Short format video is what it is. Short attention span theater is what it is. Um, but if you can do that, if you can get onto the shorts, that gets seen to more people. And I've got more people right now watching the short, or at least as many people watching my shorts on YouTube as I do on Instagram. And there's 17,000 people over on Instagram. So the algorithm is a little bit different over here. I think it's, it's not easier, I would say, but I would say it's more fair if you're consistent than it is on Instagram. I feel like Instagram is is rigged a little bit more because they always send you stuff on Instagram about, hey, if you pay us, you, more people will see this. And I'm like, man, I'm not paying y'all nothing. I can get that reels to hit if I get one of those. And I don't know what it takes to make one of those reels hit, but I'll get 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. I've got one that hit 4 million. Um, if you get them to hit, you'll get way more than even, even paying for them. So if you're trying to build, I would hit the short format stuff, but to catch on YouTube is the short format stuff doesn't count towards your watch time. You can get, it's like you can get 4,000 watch hours in a year or like 10 million short views will also qualify you to start getting money. So it's kind of weird, but I've just been splitting it kind of even because you add to the shorts and like I'll get at least like 800 views on the shorts usually, but sometimes I'll run up 24, 2,500. I don't think I've had many more than that on there, but still 2,500. And that's, that's about what uh, Instagram is with 17,000 subs over there. So like I said, I don't, I don't really see the advantage to, uh, to working that hard on Instagram anymore. Um, I'll keep posting stuff over there and I'll keep up with it and everything, but you can make some pretty serious money on here if you can get popular enough. So I'm going to feed this monkey for a while and see how it goes. Dustin. Oh, okay. You guys are chatting amongst yourselves. I'm just reading real quick. Make sure I'm not missing any questions. Itching my face off because of this stupid allergy. Scroll back real quick. No, I don't think I missed anything on y'all. Oh, I don't know what I hit there. Great. What in the wide world of sports is going on, boys? Oh, man. Anyway, we're coming up on an hour. What's up, Hook? Good to see you, man. But yeah, that was um, so 1300, 1400, about 13, 14 and some change, I think, now on the viewer hours. And I, there's about, I don't know, eight or 900 of that it's just in the last few months. So it's going along pretty good. Um, it just, it's a grind, man. And you've got to like, you got to make the cuts. Like if you don't edit the videos, right. People won't watch them. You know, they just, you know, especially on YouTube. So like I said, you've got to, it's a lot of work. It's a, it's been a lot of work, especially for me. Cause I'm not really great, great with a computer. Yeah, you'll be working. Don't you, you? You you'll never you'll never fight. You'll never win that fight with Crappy Malone. Never. I tell you how you win it. You drain it till it's dry. Put them all in the sun, then you win. <clears throat> That's what I like to do, especially for the crappy. And I'll give you some real world examples about how this works. About eighty percent of the time. Now, we talked about it a little bit earlier about sometimes a bass will be stunted and you go in, you'll pull them out and all of a sudden everything will be fine. You know, they'll get big again. Everything's great. Um, every once in a while, probably like 20% of the time you go in and they hit the crappy real hard and it kind of does fix it. You know, some ponds you'll have crappy um, and they just don't completely ruin it. You know, you'll have pretty good crappy fishing, pretty good bass fishing, you know, kind of goes okay together 
and it doesn't do, but then the rest of the time it just, it ruins it. Just, your bass are skinny and it's just ruined, you know? Um, I had one fellow, I can't remember his name, but he, he had a five acre pond on Instagram and he's like, I'm, I'm going to go fix it. I'm going to go harvest crappy. And I'm like, man, you need to drain it. So he goes and pulls 290 pounds of crappy out of a five acre pond, which is probably a third of the biomass of the pond. A third of that is just, you know, 25, 30 to 35% of the entire fish population was tied up in crappy. So he's man, he's sending me his relative weights. He's, you know, he's checking his feet. All his bass are skinny, look like crap. And as we food, you know, we've talked about, and then uh, he goes and pulls all those crappy out. And then his bass were even smaller the next year than they were before he even started doing all that work. And that is normal. Go bust your ass, harvest crappy, clean all those fish, have a bunch of fish fries, have your buddies over. You go through all that work only to have to go do it again the next year. You ain't done. You ain't never done doing that when you've got crappy. you got to tee them up. And, and then it's disheartening when you go do all that work and it gets worse and that's where you'll be most of the time. Oh man, like I said, I, I wanted to have Mickey on here. I don't know if Mickey's in the chat right now, but, um, we we're going to talk about that. Exactly. He's got a pond uh, about 10 acres in Thomasville, Georgia, and he did just that. He went, for check this out he went for lat not it was right when i first started going on instagram so about 2020 2020 and 2021 those two growing seasons he pulled but across both those seasons he pulled three thousand crappy out of that 10 acre pond and you couldn't we go over there you couldn't catch nothing i mean you couldn't catch bass you still can't i'll go over there and run a video up and show y'all you can't catch a hardly catch a bass over there um yeah, he pulled 3,000 crappy out, about hand size, filled buckets and buckets and buckets up, and didn't do a thing. Didn't fix nothing. Just all that work for nothing. Mm. My Lord, I've got to get some allergy medicine. All right. I don't know what you guys are talking about stripers or something hybrid stripers working ponds now they will eat all the fish in the pond but they're pretty fun to have in there uh black versus white crappy yeah i hear guys ask that question all the time i don't think so man um i actually heard somebody saying that there's somebody selling like triploid crappy like crappy that don't spawn and i wouldn't trust that either um, actually I've, I did have one conversation with a guy a few years ago about how he stocked those and then the crappy started spawning. I'm like, yeah, no shit. But no, I don't, I don't think it matters too much. We've got both black and white crappy in Georgia and, um, they don't help. They don't help at all. Oh my gosh. <sighs> I'm trying to think Benadryl or. Benadryl put me to right to sleep. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. What's that, Flonay stuff? Maybe that stuff's what I need. Yeah, Southeast, I don't, I don't know if crappy, um, I don't know if they spawn twice. They certainly could spawn twice a year. Um, I know they spawn once in the spring real hard, but where the problem is too, um, where the pro real problem lies. Thanks, Dustin, man. Where the, where the problem lies with the crappy is when a bajillion of them hatch out in the springtime. Um, their fry are eating everything. It's the tiny, tiny baby crappy, not the adult crappy you're out there catching that are messing you up real bad. Does that make sense? Like getting the adults out is fine, but you're never going to get them all out. And those females are going to come right back in the next spring and just replace their numbers. So it's a larval fish war. It's really not an adult fish problem. 
although the adult fish are eating bass fry and they're eating what bluegill they're eating bluegill and what bluegill want to eat they're they're it's a big cog in the wrench a wrench in the wheel or wrench in the gears you know it's just it just doesn't work they they're they're wearing you out from multiple levels they're throwing they're like a good boxer they're throwing punches at funny angles <laughs> I know, right? Dude, it was like 76 degrees down here today, but I'm pretty sure somebody's got a fire going. That's what's got me going. <clears throat> yeah, man, they get on the zooplankton and they get on and they, well, what they're doing too is since they're a little earlier in the spring than bass, they're big enough to eat the bass fry as soon as the bass fry are hashed out. So they can wipe your bass reproduction just completely out. That is, you know, if you want to talk about wiping out bass reproduction, crappy wipe out bass reproduction. Way worse than any bass fisherman fishing on a bed does. I can promise you that. All right, boys. I am, I've got to quit. I've got to go get some medicine. But thanks for hanging with me and all the good questions and engagement. And I'll try to be back on here next Sunday night and we can do it again. Hopefully I can get Wilson on here and we can talk about the real, real life crappy issues and, and what he did out there. But uh, I appreciate you boys. We'll see you next time.